Now then, my name is Ryan Central and today we will be talking Endgame for Borderlands 3 and a few things that the developer said to me in interviews that I got to do with them at the gameplay event last week that give us a lot more information on how it's all going to work and how it's evolved over time with the looter shooter genre. But most importantly, how this whole game has poised and prepared itself for Endgame in mind, stuff about boss mechanics and how some of them will have WoW-esque raid mechanics that if done badly will get you killed. All that in mind today's video, first thing I want to say is that we have a giveaway going on at the moment. It's in the comments below, really easy to enter so I'll move on from there. This interview came from Kate Pitstick who is a level designer and also a designer of missions. And the other interviewee was Matt Cox who is the lead boss designer of Borderlands 3. Sorry about the quality with some of the audio in here, but we'll start with the questions that I fielded Kate, and starting with a big one. There's been a big gap between Borderlands 2 and Borderlands 3, and the looter genre since Borderlands 2 has grown and evolved a lot more. So how has Borderlands 3 aged alongside the looter shooter genre? And one of the, the biggest things has been like, people wondering with how the looter shooter genre has evolved, you know, what are we doing? And really, what we are trying to do is stay true to what the original games were. Um, we're not trying to do the microtransactions or the always online things or the the shared world shooters, I guess they're called now. Um, we've really been trying to focus on, okay, how does this play on couch co-op? You know, is it still fun to play offline as it is to play uh, online with another friend? Um, and focusing on classic Borderlands details like that. Um, the whole looter shooter genre, it definitely seems straight away the Borderlands 3 was just kind of like, we're just going to do what we do anyway. Was there anything that you think like caught your eye from what, not necessarily other people did, but like as time's moved on that you thought, Borderlands 3 could definitely do with something like this? I mean, yes, but that, that's the same with any game that we've played. It's been like, you know, especially some of the, the recent single player games that have come out. Mm -hmm. um, looking at how they did very basic uh, character narrative interactions or um, repeatable missions, like figuring out what other games were doing well and what what we could borrow from those that would still make sense within our game. Like one of, one of the pitfalls I think happens with certain other games is that they'll see other games that are succeeding and take bits and pieces of that and fit it into their narrative, but it doesn't fit well. Right. Um, so really trying to find the, a good balance of what makes sense to borrow from these other titles that, that works with us. Replayable missions were mentioned by Kate, so I wondered how the new Borderlands was planning to go about repeating important quests, if that was going to be possible at all, whether it be daily, stuff like that, and this is what Kate had to say. There are options. Uh, one of the basic ones that you'll see in the demo itself right now are the bounty board missions. Um, so, for example, when I was playing through the demo, I ran into the Baron. Um, and I was able to, to fight him and go through that whole interaction before I actually picked up the bounty to go and kill him. Um, or it could be like, I've already killed him in my game, but you drop into my game and you haven't. So that bounty would appear and we could go fight him together. Um, so doing things like that. Um, there are a couple other instances of specific repeatable missions uh, that, were, that were developed to make sense of Oh, cool, yeah, I did this this way the first time, but I want to do that again this other way. Yeah. Uh, and they are specifically tailored for that. Because naturally, it's just, Borderlands, a lot of it is just, you know, killing general knocks like a hundred times to get the right, best weapon. Yeah. So I guess there was an element of you trying to almost make a narrative for that, for it to make sense, I suppose, as opposed to just, yeah, I killed this guy a hundred times and I don't know why, really. Like, yeah, it's a yeah. Story, like. um, we, we try to kind of address that and make that make sense. Um, but it is still the Borderlands universe, so. Right, the big end game question that you wanted to have an answer to came next. Instead of paraphrasing what I asked her, I'll leave in me asking a question in the audio so it's easier for you to get context for it. But basically, how are they going about end game? It sounds like you've set yourself up quite nicely for like end game to an extent where it's like, no doubt the story will progress, you'll fight the Eclipses, you might beat them, you might not, but it sounds like it's not just going to be one of those things where you finish the campaign and then it's kind of like, I'm just going to do all these other random things. Like it sounds like, <laughs> if anything, you're setting yourself up for when you hit max level, whatever that is, and why you might do some of that like pinnacle like raid content or whatever. Whereas before it was kind of more like you will just go fight General Knox or whoever like Promorax right. for the sake of it. It sounds like you'll have the main story, 
and then it will open up and actually make sense instead of just right and especially um especially after watching twitch and seeing the people who had had been constantly streaming you know since borderlands 2 had launched or since uh the pre sequel launch, launch, uh, and then developing their own community events around in-game content, coming up with their huge Excel sheet of for the hunt of, okay, yeah, yeah. this is how many points that you'll get if you get this or that. Um, we've definitely taken into account in-game and post-launch content. Uh, hopefully around closer to September 13th and definitely at E3, we'll be able to share a little bit more about that. Okay, cool. There are two major things to go over with what Keith said, but the first is that we will be getting more information at E3, which is about six weeks away. So it really isn't that long at all. There's going to be some big PR beats every single month for Borderlands until the launch in September. We have E3 in June, bits and pieces in July, as well as Gamescom in August. So we won't have to wait too long to find out new information on how Endgame is going to work. The other thing that Kate mentioned that was interesting is The Hunt, which is a community weekly long challenge where they raise money for charity and where players and streamers in Borderlands 2 have to collect as many legendaries per lesson weapons and loot as possible and whoever gets the most points by getting the most legendaries and stuff wins. This is a very dumbed down description on what this event actually is but it's very interesting that Gearbox referred to this in person when talking about Endgame. They know how the community over all of these years have created their own challenges and Endgame which not only Gearbox knows about, they fully understand why it works and what makes it interesting and have positioned their content to be more like that instead of just doing what everybody else is doing which i would say is very exciting not to mention that i spoke to the xbox on guys whilst i was out there and they spoke to a producer that said if you liked previous borderlands end games then you'll like the end game in borderlands 3. but this goes on nicely to the other interview instead of talking about the loot itself we really need to talk about how to get that loot that's the end game the challenge the pinnacle content and that brings us on talking to matt cox about bosses and we'll talk about mechanics first, as this is a really big area that leads on to the rest of the questions that I asked. So again, I will leave my audio to give you context on what I was asking, because not only is the new Borderlands going to have more bosses in previous games, but the bosses are going to be a lot more important when it comes to mechanics. Like, Border like Borderlands 1 is like a really good example of a game that had a lot of bosses, but what I thought was quite interesting as well is like the bosses in Borderlands 1 were fairly, you know, straightforward. You were against them, they shoot, you shoot them. This looks like it has more mechanics, especially. Is that something that you've put like a lot of time and effort into and wanted to sort of push on that? Because there's a lot of games in that looter shooter genre that kind of touches on that, but not really goes too deep with it. Yeah, I think it's important for us, again, not just the one the bosses I design, but uh, the ones that uh, a lot of the other uh, AI designers, uh, or yeah, the creature designers design. We want to leave people with a moment, right? We want something very distinct. So for me personally, if you play one of my bosses and then at the end you don't have this moment where you're like, oh, remember when that boss did fill in the blank? If I haven't delivered that moment, then I probably haven't done my job right. So yeah, we want to leave people with a distinct, fun combat moment that like, really got that adrenaline rushing. Before we go any further, I need to go over a big bit of information. At least according to somebody on Reddit, Gearbox defined Gigamind, Shiv, and Mouthpiece, the bosses that we've seen so far in the Borderlands new gameplay, they've defined them as mini bosses. So these are not big pinnacle bosses, which is good because the mechanics in the stuff that we've seen so far is fairly straightforward and generic. There's a big difference, for example, between Mouthpiece's mechanics of move out of the way of the subwoofers versus, you know, like a full World of Warcraft raid encounter that will one-shot kill you if you mess up. So I asked Matt in this next question if there were going to be raid-esque mechanics of do it wrong and you die in Borderlands 3. Uh, I will say with certain battles, you'll definitely have more... Uh you can make more fatal mistakes yeah, against some certain bosses. We would, I don't think we'd want to do that with every single boss encounter because then it might just get uh, frustrating. But yes, you, you will see new things you probably didn't expect to happen while you're playing and you have to learn something new in order to beat the boss. Now at this point in the interview, I raised a point to Matt that I am a YouTuber that likes making and watching guides for content like this. You know, the fat boss raid guides for World of Warcraft, tips and tricks on how to beat certain enemies that require a little bit more explanation and know how to be able to do them. I asked him basically, would I be making boss raid guides on YouTube in a similar vein? Would I be explaining mechanics in order for people to do them? This was his answer. I think so. I mean, in, in any 
in any boss fight, uh, you, there's going to be a particular strategy that might work better uh, than most to defeat bosses. So we want to make sure that our bosses uh, feel definitely feel powerful, feel very intimidating, but at the same time, like learnable to a some extent. It's like then you start to understand how they behave so that you can figure out a new strategy to overcome whatever that is. For sure. And that's everything that I wanted to share about the main endgame stuff in terms of interviews. But there is one final thing that I did want to mention. When it comes to the topic of endgame, a lot of focus has gone onto the Guardian ranks, which replace bar badass ranks from previous games. Instead of badass, Guardian will unlock once you've completed all of the story missions. And for each of the two Vault Hunters that we've seen, Amara and Zane, they have the same bonus stats on their screen. To get bar stats and ranks, you need to complete challenges, which isn't the same in Borderlands 3. There are challenges in the game that you complete from just doing random bits and pieces, but you don't get any tokens to redeem in this fashion. Instead, we have to wait until end game to find out exactly how to get those stats. But as you can see, there are some of the stats in the Guardian rank that are very similar to Bar, especially. You know, the typical stuff, shield recharge delay, shield recharge rate, gunfire rate, gun damage. These are all stats that were in the badass rank system in previous games, but there are some new ones such as fight for your life duration and fight for your life movement speed. So they haven't really changed too much with how the system works, but it's more established and elaborated on when you complete the main story, which means that this whole system doesn't come into play until end game. And considering that you can see this in the menu straight away, goes to show that yeah, this game is made with end game in mind because you open up the menus and one of the tabs is purely around this system. A lot of the focus, especially coming from the developers, is that Borderlands 3 has evolved with the genre as a whole, but ultimately it's very much a Borderlands game. It isn't too different, but they know what works with other games. They have been uh, not afraid to sort of play other titles and work out what's good about them and being able to sort of take certain elements from it. Kate did speak about single player games and how it affects the narrative, but no doubt they have looked at other MMO like looter shooters like Destiny, Anthem, Division, what they have done well, I guess most importantly what they've done awfully and how they've been able to cherry pick certain elements whilst also making sure that it is a Borderlands game, that it isn't this always online game like Kate mentioned. So it's the best of both worlds. You get a game that has longevity, has the RPG element and looting and shooting, of course, but it doesn't have the drawbacks of an always online MMO light game as a service kind of deal. There will be DLC, there will be skins and stuff that you can get, and no doubt other Vault Hunters in the future, but this feels like it's going to be much, much more than a previous Borderlands game, which I'm really excited about. There is other stuff to talk about in this interview, but in terms of end game and where that's going with Borderlands 3, that's basically everything that I wanted to talk about today. So thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Do like and subscribe if you did. There'll be more Borderlands stuff going on at the moment. And I really enjoyed going to the gameplay event and learning more about what we're going to be seeing. But thanks again for watching, take care, and I'll see you soon.